how is everybody doing? Strength Chat episode 142. And today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I'm joined by a strength conditioning coach who works with some of the world's elite combat athletes. Today I am joined by the one and only Dr. Corey Peacock. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. That's too much of an introduction. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for, for taking the time to jump on. Um, how have you been? What's been? Uh, look at that, and then I let my phone go off. I apologize. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. We can edit that out. We can edit that out. It's fine. Um, right. Yeah. How, how have you been doing? What's been happening on in your world? What have you been working on recently? You know, uh, a lot, obviously, with the times that we're in right now, trying to trying to navigate this. Um, you know, as you said, I'm the head strength and conditioning coach at Sanford MMA. So. Uh, those of you that are listening that do follow the MMA scene, um, this is probably what you know as was Hard Knocks 365. It's been rebranded as Sanford MMA. Um, so we're, we're, we're housing about, you know, I would say just shy of 60 fighters, probably about 30 to 40 of which are Bellator, 1FC, or uh, UFC, of course. Uh, outside of that, I'm uh, the program director at Nova Southeastern University for the undergraduate program of exercise and sports science, and also the master's program of sports science as well. So, um, you know, realistically trying to navigate those two things at the same time in the, in the, you know, the crisis that we're in now in terms of numbers and, you know, just the logistics of fitting people into the schedule and how many people I can have at a certain given number of time. Uh, it's been crazy. Yeah. And how is, because um, I know it went through a phase where, you know, it might be training, it might be changing coming um, uh, when it starts getting a little bit winter, but how have you found getting um, people in and, and, and training and, um, and, and managing it all? Is, it, is training slightly back to normal, just in smaller groups, or, or how, is it, how is it looking? I think it's slightly back to normal, but I still think there are some limitations that are involved, especially numbers wise, especially quality of training wise. Um, you know, it's just a, a couple of just different things that we haven't had in the past, but I feel like even certain things like making weight are just a little bit more difficult fighting those three round fights. You know, you're finding these just a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, so I think that's all a testament to, to what we're doing. I think we've gotten a better grasp on it now. But I mean, for, for a little while there, it was sort of a sort of a free for all, you know, we still had all of the UFC events that were going on. And in terms of our situation, so we are in South Florida, we're in Broward County, which is, you know, essentially probably the hot spot for COVID right now. So, I mean, there are a lot of restrictions on training in terms of gyms can even be open, can be closed whose garage we were training in, who's, you know, it, there was a lot of things that we had to really do. I mean, I, I look at, you know, Kamar Usman is uh, one of my top clients and uh, I bet we spent six weeks of this COVID thing training out of his garage, training in his driveway, you know, making do with, you know, luckily the, the kettlebells, the sandbags, everything that we had, but, uh, you know, we got the work in. Uh, we've been really fortunate in terms of success with our team. I mean, the wins and losses. I mean, we're winning about three out of four right now, which is, you know, which is great. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it, life goes on and it's an unfortunate situation, but we're, we're making the best out of it. Nice. Uh, and along with the, the coaching and, uh, you know, the, uh, the coaching areas that you, that you mentioned, um, have you got any other projects that you're working on or anything coming up in the, in the future as well? Um, yeah, you know, outside of the, you know, and, and I will say this, I know it's a strength chat coach, you know, the, the strength and conditioning thing for me, um, you know, it's something I very much enjoy, but I think as a, you know, really as a professional, as a practitioner, you know, I spend more of my time as an academic and as a researcher. I mean, that, that's just my training, you know, I have a PhD in exercise physiology. So I do spend, you know, quite about quite a bit of time at the university running those two programs and that kind of thing. Um, we currently have an academic nonprofit society known as the Society for Neurosports. So we're about, you know, let me think, we're just a little over a year. Now we're just a little bit less than a year, but we were coming up on our second year for our society. We had to change the date. So we're going to have the second annual conference, you know, fingers crossed in March. 
Yeah. Um, this is a collaboration myself. I have another exercise physiologist, Dr. Jose Antonio. Um, those in the strength world, nutrition world, if you've heard of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, yeah, he's yeah. actually CEO, president, founder of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. So he sort of helped myself and Dr. Jamie Tartar, who's a neuroscientist, sort of navigate the waters of creating a society and, and all of those things. But really this, the specialization on it um, is really this, you know, for me, obviously coming from prior to MMA football and now MMA, you know, I'm in high contact sports. I mean, that, that, that's been my, my focus, my application for so long. Um, Dr. Tartar, who's the neuroscientist has a military background, a postdoc from Harvard. I mean, she's, she's brilliant. And a lot of her research involves sleep and different biomarkers of inflammation and stress and, and, and all of the things associated with contact sports in my mind. You know, so we've really been able to bring this collaboration and try to create an entity and a, an academic society where practitioners from multiple disciplines, physical therapy, occupational therapy, athletic training, exercise scientists, neuroscience, sports psychology, can bring this data together to help sort of, you know, to enhance the field of, you know, essentially sports and cognitive function, mental ability brain damage, different things like that. You know, I find that there hasn't been a platform for that. It's, you know, the psychologists go to psychology conferences, athletic training goes to athletic training conferences, exercise scientists go to exercise science conferences. And there hasn't been a place for all of these different disciplines to sort of fuse together and, and enhance the field. So, um, you know, we have that going. Uh, outside of that, a lot of different research in those areas as well. Um, you know, we have a grant right now where we're exploring different biomarkers associated, different proteins associated with, you know, potential brain damage, brain health, brain function, and stuff like that in contact sports. Um, a lot of genetic stuff looking at, you know, essentially the susceptibility of these athletes to utilize different hormones and things associated with stress and performance and, and things like that. So a, really a lot going on. Oh, cool. And I suppose like when you mentioned there, um, you know, um, coming from a, an MMA background and then others coming from a, a military background, um, I always like to think about um, uh, what areas you can pick things from and use within your field. Cause there's always something you can, um, uh, you can use, uh, maybe not, um, it's directly associated with that, but um, yeah, it's cool that you know trying to bring um, a few different backgrounds to, together so that um, you know you can have a look at different things. And with the uh, is that research that you're uh, conducting at the minute is that um, currently happening or is that a project for later down the line? Yeah, so I can kind of briefly go over some of the research that we're that we're doing. Um, and I you actually got it pulled up here in front of me, but. Um, you know, the first thing that I kind of mentioned was uh, sort of hormonal control, but we have a, we actually have a published research study out right now, essentially analyzing what's known as the warrior warrior gene or the COMT gene. Um, I'm sure people have heard of this, but essentially it's just this. It's really in terms of this warrior gene, these individuals can basically have a higher tolerance for pain. They also perform better under stress and in terms of like processing and their processing stimuli, they actually do better with a lot of different distractions and things like that compared to the, you know, compared to in this case for this study, we used college active controls and we actually use collegiate athletes as well. So we analyzed, you know, basically these professional mixed martial artists and I believe we had about 20 compared to about 40 controls overall. Um, and we found a significant predisposition for this warrior gene, as opposed to the warrior gene where these individuals do not perform well under stress. And so I think it's cool. I mean, I think it's, it's something that we expected, um, but it is cool to see it in, in actual literature and to actually see it in science. You know, I, I kind of go back to the story where you're, you're looking at kind of looking at the landscape of MMA right now, and you think about, you know, these, these fighters, you know, I'll look at Kamaru, for instance, 
Um, you know, previous fights, obviously he's fighting in front of 15,000 people as the world champion. There's all of that associated with it. Cameras in his face, 10 people walking him down the aisle. You know, that's an environment when you look at this warrior gene that is, you know, basically set up for success because you have this ability to, to process these things and, and to work well under this and be able to manage your dopamine levels more adequately than somebody that couldn't. Um, you know, here we go, Fight Island, the whole, you know, there's so much associated with it, the production, but, you know, talking to him and as, as he said, as he's walking out of this tunnel, you know, it's like, you don't have the cameras in your faces. People are keeping their distance. There's nobody in the crowd. You know, it, it, it's almost an eerie, weird feeling yeah. being in this octagon trying to, you know, is this, is this really the competition that I'm used to? And, you know, for somebody like him, it's, it's been you know, probably 15 fights since he's been fighting in front of a, you know, a very small, minimal crowd and, and things like that. But I mean, probably the smallest crowd that he's ever fought against. So it was one of those things where, you know, he said, you know, listening to him and, and the way he felt it, it took about really about eight minutes to really feel like, okay, now I feel stressed. Now I feel under pressure. Now I feel like I'm in a fight. You know, so, so I think it's, I think it's interesting research realistically when you look at it and, and, and kind of seeing what we're doing. Definitely with the, with the current environment as well. Cause I know from the, uh, the, I, I know when, uh, just as lockdown, um, was sort of happening and, um, UFC came, um, you know, back on, it was, it was live. It was strange, you know, when it's walking out and the music's still playing, but like you say, going from having X amount of thousand people in the stadium to, then having um, no one there, just sort of like backroom staff and referee and everything, it must be from an athlete's perspective um, a weird, a weird feeling. Because I do think coming like myself coming from a, a rugby background, you kind of feed off the crowd a little bit more. Um, that so quite interesting. It might be you know it's a, a couple of questions that I've probably got uh, on that. But just taking a little bit of a, um, a step back, obviously mentioned about um, coming from a football background, working in MMA, but also an uh, academic background as well. Just want to give a little bit of a, a background to yourself and um, your progression through your uh, coaching and academic career, if you like. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, for, for me, I was a collegiate football player. I uh, was fortunate enough to continue on after my, after my master's degree at Kent State University. Um, and I was pursuing a PhD in exercise physiology. So I was able to split time between strength and conditioning and also the classroom laboratory setting, um, you know, which was uh, just a great experience for me. Uh, when I finished my PhD in exercise physiology, uh, I took a academic position at Nova Southeastern University down in South Florida where I am now. Um, you know, I would say after about a year, I, I'll be honest, when I finished that PhD, I mean, I was, I was burnt out there. There's no doubt about it. I was, I was legitimately just burnt out from the speed, from the, the intensity, the, the process that this entailed. I mean, I don't think people realize the, the, the academic process that goes behind that, the hours spent, you know, from five in the morning prepping research to seven till three running research to sitting in the classroom to coming back and setting up for the next day. I mean, there, there's really a lot that's involved behind the scenes of that process outside of just the classroom. I mean, that there really is. And, uh, you know, I came down here in South Florida and I feel like about, I'd say about eight months in, you know, I remember I had a few people asking me to came down to visit and, you know, here we are drinking a couple beers, sitting on the beach, enjoying life. And they're like, you know, when you came down here, you said you were going to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm sitting there thinking, shit, I haven't done any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my academic career started. I'm having fun, but I, I haven't made any connections in the year. I haven't, I haven't went out and hustled like I used to. Yeah. And uh, I kind of had that realization like, all right, you're, you're done with vacation. I know South Florida is fun. I know the beach is great, but you know, this isn't a vacation anymore. Um, so I was able to make a, a lot of good connections back with my, you know, basically my football experience. Uh, I was able to produce some research with the, former head strength and conditioning coach at the Miami Dolphins, Darren Krein, uh, who I believe, you know, was at the Colts as well, has, has been a lot of different high places. Um, and he and I did a couple of things on soft tissue work, trigger point work, uh, you know, a co collaboration between some of the collegiate athletes, some of his uh, practice squad players and stuff like that. So we were able to produce some of that. 
Um, outside of that, he, he had some good connections, uh, Florida Panthers. I actually spent a season with the University of Miami down in Florida doing football as well on top of teaching. So, I mean, it, it was a grind. That, that's for sure. You know, going from basically Fort Lauderdale to Coral Gables and, and people that aren't familiar with South Florida, that's about a 20 mile trip, but 20 miles down here could be anywhere from 40 minutes to three hours. You just never know. I went to uh, my, uh, my girlfriend's uncle lives in uh, St. Augustine. Um, mm-hmm. I went over, or we both went over um, last year um, yeah. and we were looking on the maps to drive around. So uh, and in my head, I, I never quite, because obviously driving around the UK, it's never, it's never going to be a, a, a massive drive. But um, yeah, when you say that it can be a long drive, I completely understand. I mean, I only did that. We were over there for just over two weeks. Um, so if you're doing that for any, any longer, yeah, yeah I, I, completely, I completely see where you're coming from. I was doing that for a year and a half, driving <laughs> back and forth between the university and, and University of Miami for football and, and stuff like that. So outside of that, uh, an opportunity came about. Um, I, I laugh because I think about like my first opportunity with mixed martial arts. It was actually Vitor Belfort. So, you know, anybody that's an MMA fan is like, wait, what? Like the guy's a legend. I mean, that's a living legend. And, and I'll be honest, I got a voicemail from him. And obviously I've never met him. He doesn't have my number. And I truly, I, I, I truly thought it was somebody pulling a prank on me, like somebody from home or something like that. I'm like, where's this even coming from? And then I got a, got a call from, you know, Miami Dolphins head strength coach. And he just said, you know, hey, I got a call from this MMA guy that uh, wants to do some, some physiology testing. So I gave him your contact. I hope you don't mind. Said, yeah, sure. You know? And so that's really where it started. I really started using my, you know, my exercise physiology expertise and uh, was hired by the Black Zillions. Um, had a great strength and conditioning coach there, Jake Bonacci. Um, in my mind, you know, obviously no disrespect to anybody. I mean, I just, because I've worked with him for so long, I mean, I think he's the, the best of the best. When, you, when it comes to MMA strength and conditioning. And, uh, you know, and I say that because I just look at the, the credentials. I look at the quality of athletes he's had and really the duration more than anything else. I mean, he started back with Randy Couture fighting Gabriel Gonzaga for the world title. I mean, we're talking just a long duration in the sport, multiple UFC champions from Vitor to, you know, and, and the list goes on and on. So he, he did it at a very high level and, and I was fortunate enough to, to spend a lot of time with him, you know, sort of bringing my, you know, I guess my expertise with his strength and conditioning expertise. And I was just very fortunate because it made me a lot better at what I did. It made me a lot better at understanding MMA. I mean, I was bringing this almost, I want to say, this football mentality, this football type programming over to the MMA thing. And and I remember Jake kind of having this conversation with me, like, you know, the biggest thing you can do is, is make sure you are charting your results, you know, make sure you're testing, make sure you're doing that thing, make sure you understand what your programs are doing for these guys. And I remember after about the first 10 weeks charting it and seeing the numbers nowhere near where I thought they were going to be. So he and I sat back down and analyzed it. And, you know, you've got to really realize with this sport, with, with MMA, I mean, less is more. I, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing. These guys are training so many highly neurologically demanding specializations and, and skills for each discipline that, you know, the difficulty and the volume and the intensity and the rest intervals, like all of these things really make a difference, you know, every aspect of their training. And if you as a strength and conditioning coach are, are spending too much time with the athlete, if you are putting too much stress on the athlete, if you're creating too much damage with this athlete and this runs into the next day of training, I mean, you're fucked. I mean, yeah. realistically, the guy I work with, you know, our, our head coach, head striking coach, Henry Hooft is a, you know, a Dutch kickboxer, hundred plus fights. And let's just say he's not shy about what he says. Okay, let, let's just put it that way. And again, I've worked in the football setting. So for me, this is something that, okay, whatever. And I know, you know, a week, I know to make the correction and it's never going to be an issue after that. Yeah. He's a guy that he's, he's very, he's going to say exactly what he thinks. 
probably going to be a little bit overboard in the way that that comes out for just the time being. But, but again, like I said, I, he's also a really good coach and he, he understands results and he understands the things that are going on. And when he sees those corrections, he's good. So, so again, it's one of those things that, you know, I have done that. I'm guilty, especially early on where I was, you know, it was really too much volume, really too much damage and, and things like that. And, you know, we, Henry and I have had, you know, he's had some choice words with me and, you know, but here we are, you know, six years later, really, you know, really trying to create something, something great. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just been very rewarding. So, you know, I'm here now, I've stayed with the academic side. I mean, that really is my, my bread and butter in, in yeah. terms of what I do as a practitioner. I mean, I'm, I really, you know, I, I know this is strength chat, but I feel like my specializations are really the sports sciences yeah. The, the tech heavy, the research heavy. I mean, I think that's where I excel because I'm very comfortable with that. That's where all my traditional training is. I've just been fortunate enough to, to pretty much spend my entire life in a strength and conditioning room. Yeah. You know, that's my passion. That's what I like to do. But I, you know, I, I can openly say it. I don't think it's where I'm best. Yeah. I think, and, and from that, you know, looking at the, the work that you've uh, uh, put out there and from the academic um, uh, background, um, and that's why I kind of wanted to pick your brains a little bit because, um, especially with uh, uh, with the combat sports side of things, the the sports science side of things isn't sort of um, I don't I don't think is is seen quite a lot of. There's a lot of the training side of things, and you know, look at um, you know the like you never made a grappling and striking and, and that sort of stuff. But coming from an academic background coming from the football side of things because you know um there's plenty of research out there you can see that they're wearing the monitors so you can track how much they're running how have you found trying to bring um, a bit more of the sport science side of things into uh, a combat and um, sport environment where sometimes you know it might be uh, all the methods or different ways of, of doing doing things how, how have you found that and has it um, since when you first started, has the sports science sort of progressed in um, in combat sports? You know, I would say, <clears throat> to, to answer your question, I mean, yes, there, there's now a place for sports science in combat sports. Um, you know, really, when you look at it, I, I look at all the, diff the different coaches out there. You know, I already mentioned Jake Bonacci. You know, you have Phil Daru. You have a lot of really good guys out here that are just destroying it on the, the strength and conditioning side. I mean, just leading the way. You know, I don't consider myself one of those guys. I consider myself one of the guys that's more on the, you know, more on the, the sports science side, being able to contribute that to the, the strength and conditioning. And, um, you know, for me, I have a, a mentor of mine, Tony Ricci. He's the, the head strength coach up at Longo Weidman. But again, similar to me, he also runs an academic department up at Long Island University. So, so, you know, I've really been influenced by him and a lot of the work that, that he's doing. And, uh, but, you know, th that's the thing. I'm coming from a collegiate football background. You know, I'm coming from a university that has a lot of the resources, the bells, the whistles, the GPS, like you mentioned, catapult. Um, you know, I also spend a lot of time, my research is all over the place, but, you know, I do have a couple of publications in terms of GPS tracking in you know, collegiate football players. So we have, you know, division one SEC data that myself and a data analyst of mine, <clears throat> Dr. Gabe Sanders, he's the head sports scientist up at Northern Kentucky University. So, you know, phenomenal basketball program, you know, they're always making the, the NCAA tournament and March Madness and stuff like that. Um, you know, so, so we've been able to spend a lot of time around that in different sports. Uh, he and I have done a lot of different, a lot of different work down here when we're able to get together in the MMA world with the, the GPS as well. And, and it's interesting because you got to think about how this GPS works. This GPS works, and let's just use some of the simple metrics. Let's use something like player load, okay? See, I think a lot of people don't really necessarily use the metrics that they're not comfortable with. You know, people understand speed, people understand velocity, people understand distance traveled. People don't understand what they don't understand. And, and I get that, you know, nobody's trained to take these GPS units, look at a spreadsheet of 2000 variables and say, oh, I know what all this means. You know, that, that, that's the tricky part about it. I think we're still learning a lot. 
Um, you know, I was fortunate, like I said, to have Dr. Sanders, uh, Brad Roll up at University of Tennessee, who's their sports scientist and strength coach, uh, to, to be able to really get a full grasp on this. But essentially, one of the metrics we look at is, in my mind, the, what I want to call it is almost wasted movement. And I don't want to necessarily call that because I, obviously there's a lot of movement that is necessary for your, for your discipline. Something like football, I don't necessarily say that I would refer to it as that. But it's basically your load. And the metric is the amount of movement in basically every single plane that's occurring over the course of time. It's an accelerometer, you know, metric. And when I look at something like fighting, what I noticed with, with our guys and, you know, correlations with heart rate and intensity and things like that, that essentially let's just use like a sparring session. And let's say we're doing a kickboxing sparring round. Okay. So no takedowns, more of just a striking based round where I see my wrestlers, I see my grapplers, my jujitsu guys, I mean, they're redlining. Their player load metrics are through the roof in terms of how much, in my mind, wasted movement they're doing because I think they're just not com as comfortable. Yeah. You know, vice versa, you look at it the other way where you see our, our strikers and now we're in a full MMA takedowns, everything live, and you see the amount of excess movement that they had compared to the striking. You know, and obviously you're adding, but, but again, same thing, vice versa, your wrestlers, your BJJ guys, now their movement way less. Like, you know, it, it's one of those things like people are like, well, if you add more modalities, the movement's going to go up. Well, that's not the case. Are people that feel comfortable with the ground, it drops. Are people that don't, it goes up. So um, we're going to publish some of that research coming up. I just, so many different things that we're trying to get out right now. Um, but th that's definitely something that we're going to probably get out in like a, a research brief, maybe just an abstract, something like that. Um, but, but it's cool. I, I think there, there's, I, the one thing I can say is, you know, when I give this advice, and I think we're starting to see this now, I always just try to encourage a strength coach. If there's two things that you can do to quote unquote implement sports science, make sure you have one piece of objective data. And I think a heart rate monitor is very easy. Yeah. Heart rate variability is very easy. Have them take it once a day when they wake up. Resting heart rate when they wake up. Uh, a vertical leap once a week. Let's just look at the neurological system. Just something objective. It doesn't even have to be very tech heavy. You know what I mean? Let, let's do a, you know, I've seen like uh, DeFranco's gym. They do a hand grip dynamometer once a week just to see where their strength is at the same time every single week based on their training. These things, I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be super advanced. But, but then again, if you're fortunate enough to be able to utilize heart rate monitors, Omega Wave, you know, whatever the case might be, then do so, you know, but, but keep it pretty consistent. Um, and then obviously, outside of one objective, have one subjective reading. And that can be something as simple as an ARC PE. That can be something as simple as a sleep quality, meal quality, you know, th those kind of things I think matter. Um, you know, for me, my subjective stuff, what I like to do, I like to basically just simply ask my athletes, scale one to 10, how hard was your session today? How hard was your second session today? But then vice versa, I'm also going to communicate with our skill coaches, whether it be wrestling, whether it be jujitsu, and ask the same thing. I think for me, it's always a good thing to think, see where the coaches think they were at, where the athletes think they were at, and then kind of be able to adjust based on that. Because I think as athletes, as coaches, we do have a tendency to over or underestimate. I mean, I just think that's the nature of, of what we do. I think the, the athletes are going to typically underestimate. I think the coaches are going to typically overestimate. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it is good having those, um, you know, those, those numbers to work off and the actual, actual data. But um, I think from the um, coaching side of things, and when we're talking about sports science, um, I did a sport and exercise uh, science degree in uh, uh, at Leeds, where I'm where I'm based now, um, and is you can get wrapped up in the numbers a little bit. Whereas actually, I think what can get lost a little bit is actually speaking to the athlete or speak. And I think it is interesting speaking to the to the coach as well. Um, and then you get a, an, an all round picture, and then you can get a little bit more um, of an accurate. Um, view to then move move forwards a little bit and, and plan a little bit more. Um, what are your when you're actually um, you know speaking and working with the coaches and the athletes? How have you found sort of the buy-in from the coaches and the athletes uh, when you're sort of speaking about this data? Because sometimes it might be. <clears throat> 
in a different environment, right? We're gonna we're gonna focus on this, focus on that. Whereas actually, you know, from the um, from the numbers and the data side of things, it might be right. Hang on, you might need to pull back a little bit. How have you found the buy-in from the coaches and the athletes? <clears throat> I think there's. I want to go back to something you said first before I answer this question. You said when you were talking about your degree, the idea of, you know, really trying to get into the numbers, really trying to understand what you're seeing and these kind of things. One thing in terms of advice too, that I can give based on what you were just saying, don't go high alert based on one reading. You know, that, that's one thing I can say. I, I think when you're using sports science, you're using sport tech, people have a pretty bad tendency. Let's just use, let's use Omega Wave for an example, okay? And, and those of you that aren't familiar with what Omega Wave is, it's essentially going to give you an interpretation of basically your neurological or power readiness, your cardiovascular readiness, and your metabolism. So it's gonna give you kind of three aspects of, of your internal training in, in terms of how you're prepared. Me personally, and what I have found is that making adjustments based on a daily reading really is a bad idea. Where in my mind, the trends that you can find is a lot more important, okay? And what I mean by that, let's, let's compare week one, camp one, to week one, camp two, to week one, camp three. Let's look at the adjustments. Are we on track? Are we where they need to be? Is this the same, you know, are these the same, what I wanna call basically red zones that we saw, patterns that we saw, throughout each camp. And guess what? If week one or if camp one resulted in a two minute knockout win, camp two resulted in a three minute knockout win, camp three, you know, then we're okay. We don't need to go on high alerts. Just listen, some of these stresses we want. I mean, that, that's part of what we do. We need to be able to stress the system. We need to be able to fatigue certain aspects of performance to, to progress these athletes. So that's one thing that I think you need to be very aware of. And I say the same thing about HRV. I say the same thing about heart rate. I say the same thing about sleep monitoring GPS. Like let's not go on high alert right away. Let's not make crazy adjustments. And I'm okay with making a little bit of an adjustment. If we see, you know, the cardiovascular system is completely wiped out and let's say we're out of camp and we have an aerobic development session. Yeah, sure. Cut it in half. I don't care about that. I mean, but let's not go on high alert and say, oh shit, we're done. We're not doing anything today. Get on the, get on the foam rollers, jump in the cold bed, you know, whatever it is. We don't, we don't need to do that. I mean, that's one thing. So, so I liked, I don't know what you said, but something registered that in my head, but moving forward to your question about, you know, same thing, coaches and buy-in. That's the same thing though. Imagine if I go up to, you know, my head coach who, you know, again, doesn't have a lot of, you know, he believes in what I do. He believes in the fact that our guys are on weight, that our guys are not getting tired, knock on wood, that our guys are, you know, strong, powerful, and stuff like that. He, he believes in that stuff. He believes in the results. That's a, that's a fact. But again, he's a guy that fought 100 plus fights and probably never lifted a weight in his life, you know? So you have to take those things. You have to take your, your circle into consideration. Um, you know, fortunately, I have a wrestling coach who, you know, is a three-time national champion out of West Virginia who spent, you know, 10 years coaching in the collegiate environment and understands, you know, has a little bit more, I don't want to say understands more, but has a little bit more experience with sports tech and, and interpretation and stuff like that. So you have to know your audience. I mean, that's just a fact. And, and really, everything you're doing is, is under the microscope. I mean, that, that's just a fact. What you're doing is, is there, and, and you need to be a part of that. Um, but bringing these things in to the coaches can be a little bit tricky. And again, overstepping your boundaries, you got to be really careful about that. Like what you have to understand with the sports tech, yes, you went to school for this. You understand, you understand these trends. You understand what overtraining is. You understand what these things are, but making, you know, but, but going in and trying to tell a, a skill coach what they need to do and how to implement it you can get into some trouble there. And again, I may have, I may have done that earlier on, you know, I, it's one of those things where I may have overstepped some boundaries saying, you know, this is what I think this is, you know, we're on risk of injury. We're on this, we're on high alert. You know, we need to be careful. And the next thing you know, that athlete goes in spars five rounds and looks like King Kong compared to what I just said. Yeah. So I think the best thing that I can say in terms of your coaching staff and in terms of buy-in both athletes, I think the athletes will buy in a little bit more. Um, 
But then again, some won't, you know, I, I have certain guys, I have certain guys that just won't buy into it, you know, very much at all. Like I have somebody like, you know, let's say Anthony Rumble Johnson, who's, you know, if people are watching right now, he's, he's making his comeback. He's not a guy he, he, he'll definitely do, you know, he, he'll wear whatever bells and whistles I ask him to, but he doesn't care. He's never going to ask me, Hey, what did this say? What did that do? He doesn't care. Just, okay, I'm done training. I'm out of here. I'm in and out of the gym. doesn't matter to him. Where like, you know, somebody like Kamaru becomes, you know, very meticulous about what he's wearing, what his numbers mean, what this is going to be, almost to the point that when we get to fight week, you know, we have to pull a lot of those things from him. You know, sometimes within like three weeks of the fight where it's like, you know, I want that data. I want to see what's going on. But if it starts to become more of a psychological stressor than, than a benefit, you know, realistically, we're two weeks away. How many adjustments are we really going to make based on our sports tech now at this point? Yeah. Minimal. So if this is becoming a stress, you know, if this is becoming a psychological stressor, we're going to pull it anyway. You know, so, so I think it's just it, it's all over the board in terms of what you're going to get. Again, the biggest thing, if you're going to bring this to the coaches, bring this information in a very user-friendly way. You know, for me now, I use a color system. I mean, that, that's exactly it. Here's where the athlete is. Here's your color. And guess what? You understand red. You understand green. Like, you, you get it. Use your coaching abilities to make any adjustments if you feel it's necessary. And, and I think that's the biggest thing. Present the information in a very user-friendly way. If suggestions are asked, be able to answer those things very clearly. And if suggestions aren't asked, trust in the coaches and their skill sets and their years and years and years of experience to be able to go out there and do what's best by the athlete. And I, I think that's the, that's the biggest key to it. And honestly, I think this is one of those things that, you know, I think this is one of those topics I could talk about all day because, you know, I'm finding this, especially in American sports now, like obviously – Obviously, where you're from, when you look at the rugby scene, if you look at, you know, the UK, if you look at Australia, if you look at all these Eastern Europe places, like, this is huge. Sports science is huge. Sports tech is huge, right? I mean, it's, that's where, you know, basically soccer or, you know, football, as you guys would call it, soccer and, and rugby is, is where all of this came from. And now here they are taking it to, you know, to, to the United States and, and implementing it there. Now, the issue becomes where it's like, you know, I, I'm finding this sort of as, as sort of a, an anomaly where I'm seeing this. It's like, so you have somebody who, let's just say, for instance, doesn't have American football experience. Yeah. Maybe they came from, maybe they came from rugby. Maybe they came from this. You know, rugby, not, not a good, necessarily a good example, because obviously there's a lot of similarities in the sport. But let's just say, let's say soccer, football, whatever the case might be. You know, bringing somebody in to this American football and, and trying to make suggestions, it, it becomes a little bit of a difficult paradigm because it's like there's an entire culture to go with the sport outside of just what the data and the numbers imply. And, and I feel like we're, we're not doing a great job. Some places are doing an incredible job, but I feel like some places, these positions, these strength coach, sports science, nutrition, some of these higher performance models are seeing some conflict because not everybody's on the same page in terms of what they believe, what the data says, what the numbers are, the capabilities of the athletes. So it's an interesting paradigm. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're creating or we, we've implemented a master's degree in sports science, which is actually rare in the United States. I know you said right. that, that you went to school for, but in the United States, um, there's not a lot of programs that, that offer a specialization in sports scientists and especially the specialization that we're offering in regards to that sports science position that we're not, we're not trying to build strength and conditioning coaches. We're not trying to build, you know, exercise physiology. We're trying to build sports scientists that want to go out there and practice that in a team setting in a team environment. So it's, it's cool to be able to do this and mentor some of these students and talk about some of the, you know, some of the experiences that I've had, like you said, with, with coaches, you know, telling, you know, from, having a coach tell me to shove my computer up my ass to, you know, all the things that go along with it. But, but again, over time, the biggest thing that matters are the results. I mean, that, that, that's just the, the fact of the matter. You can come out here and run the biggest tech heavy, you know, amazing, amazing system. And if you're three and 10 and losing, what the hell does it matter anyway? 
It is interesting, isn't it? It, it is key about results. I've got a, a friend that is a, an SNC coach and was mainly with the academy, but now he's with the, he's with the first team. Um, during the off season, um, the, it would have been last season, the start of yeah, it's that last season. Um, he actually went round um, to a couple of other um, rugby um, uh, SNC camps, and there was varying levels of um, like some gyms were really really well kitted out, some weren't weren't as well kitted out, um, but had loads of the tech side of things. Um, and I think it's like what you're what you mentioned there about. You know, having that balance, knowing what to give to the coaches, because if the coaches, um, uh, if you're stepping, um, stepping on their toes a little bit and telling them what they what they should be doing, um, I think that's when you can sometimes lose buying. But just touching on what you mentioned about, you know, some athletes that are really invested in their sports science side of things and looking at numbers, and it's interesting that you mentioned that it can be another sort of psychological stressor which might be detrimental to performance. But also there's some people who might not be that bothered about the about the numbers of the sports science side of things. Do you think that's just on a little bit of a tangent? Do you think that's just based on the person and it doesn't necessarily impact their performance because they're at that level where you know they're confident in um in you as a coach, whereas other people might just be more numbers oriented and like to see the progress on there. So I, I think personality definitely dictates how they're going to perceive this. I think there's, there's certain athletes that have certain, certain characteristics that I, that I already have almost a, a notion on how they're going to handle this. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this starts too, for me, um, you know, again, I, I am tech heavy. I am laboratory heavy. You know, every athlete that I'm going to work with is going to spend a lot of time in a laboratory prior to, to working with me. It's, it's part of what I do. You know, we need to draw blood. We need to, we need to have spit. We need to understand body composition, power, balance, movement, you know, all of these things, aerobic capacity, everything that's associated with this athlete. We have to have a blueprint. Um, you know, so I think I get a lot, I gain a lot of knowledge from them at that point in time as to how invested they are with this, how serious they take this, um, you know, those kind of things. So I, I think that's a, that, that's a big part of it. But again, I, you know, it's what we have to understand about sports tech. And again, the one thing that I'll say for my guys, I actually believe that I believe that a sport like MMA is where the sports tech can really emerge and, and matter to the athletes where I feel like if you do something like, let's just say the NFL, let's just say the NBA, you know, the NFL, you, they're, they're required. They have to wear it. You know, that's part of their contract. That's part of their job. They have to wear this tech. But I would have to believe that there are some detriments to that. I would have to believe that some of these athletes, again, and, and it most likely is, believe that this data can be used against them come contract time, come game time, you know. Yeah. They have my top speeds in game as opposed to the fact you know yeah i went out and ran a four three three at the combine but am i actually hitting that on the field am i actually hitting that during game or are the nerves the stress you know like so i just think it's a it's an interesting paradigm um you know for me and it is as transparent as i can be i try to use this not as a way to rank these athletes not as a way to to because it's it's fighting at the end of the day it's still fighting nine out of ten times the best fighter is going to win the fight. I mean, that, that's just a part of it. For me, I, you know, I use this as a tool to just try to take somebody which they're already in the top 1% in the world at what they do. And now let's try to put them into that top 0.5%. Let's try to take them to that 0.3%. You know, let's just find those little things where in my mind, using this information, using this progression, if we can get them in a mindset where they are fully confident in their preparation, where they are fully confident that physically they have the ability to go three rounds, five rounds, whatever it is, then guess what? Then, then go in there and be the better fighter. I mean, that, that, that's, just, that's just part of it. And if you guys are equal fighters and our preparation is better, then you're at the advantage anyway. So, you know, but again, in, in, in those, some of those professional sports, I, this data, I mean, could probably be used in – in multiple ways, you know, realistically, it could be, I hope, you know, I hope that's not the case. I hope we're using this for, you know, performance-based advantages and stuff like that. And I think the collegiate levels do that. Um, but, you know, I haven't experienced it much in the, in the professional setting. Yeah. It is interesting that you say there, you know, that at the end of the day, especially within combat sports, it does come down to 
um, you know, who who is going to be the better fighter, and if they are, um, if they are equal, down to the preparation. And what was just going through my head then, obviously, um, to uh, British boxers Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury in the boxing side of things, um, two very different physiques, probably equally as skillful, but it does make you think about the you know the preparation behind the scenes, um, as to what approach you know people are going to take, um, and just sort of two. Uh, follow-up question from that the data that you're giving the coaches about the um, athletes what is it your uh, what data do you provide them and um, what you think is going to be more important to them and what data are you actually tracking and then how are you um, because obviously you want the uh, the athlete you want the fighter going in uh, confident and you know feeling um, that, they're, that they're, we're in a good chance of, of winning how do you manage all of those data variables and then actually manage the athlete to make sure that, you know, that preparation is, is key and that they all, all they have to focus on is the, is the fighting side of things when it comes to, um, when it comes to fighting. Yeah. So for the coaches, I just provide them what I call a performance score. Um, and this is essentially what performance you're going to be able to, to pull out of your fighter each given day. Um, and this is a combination typically of sleep, heart rate variability and heart rate tracking. If we were going to wear the heart rate monitor, depending on what the session was um, in terms of the athlete, what I'm typically going to provide for them is a pre and post camp analysis. We are going to go back into the laboratory closer to the fight. And this is typically not going to be something like a, you know, the risk and reward dictates what we're going to do. The closeness, you know, if we're, a week and a half out, there's no way I'm going to run like a VO2 max or something like that. Right. But it doesn't mean we can't go out there and, and, and hit a wind gate and look at, look at the changes in power, look at the changes in fatigue. Um, you know, we track a lot of heart rate, we track a lot of recovery in between rounds and stuff like that. So they're going to see a lot of that. I mean, essentially what you have to understand. And, and again, this is with any sport, with any fighter, any sort of change or difference that we find that is positive, they're going to get, any sort of change that maybe didn't change or <clears throat> maybe didn't go in the right direction, we're not going to get it. I mean, we're not going to give that to them this close to the fight. You know, everything's got to be, everything's got to be good here. Um, so it, it just depends what, what we're going to provide them and, and that kind of thing, if anything at all. You know, there are certain athletes that I don't say a word to about any of their data. They don't want to know. Yeah. And I'm okay with that because they, you know, we've, we've built this relationship where they trust that I'm going to utilize this for their benefit. Yeah. And how do you, on, on that side of things, um, you know, depending from camp to camp and, and, change, and changing things around, um, how do you manage those? Is the times where um, you might let a little bit of rope go and let them run with things a little bit more and see those numbers progress a little bit? Or how much um, control do you, do you have and how much do you manipulate those? Because especially, you know, with a, within a team environment, you know, in the NFL, when we're speaking about rugby, um, obviously, you know, everyone's tracked individually, um, but you're going to train as a group, you know, you'll all go into the gym as a group and then you're going to go and do your conditioning or gameplay or whatever it is on the field. Because it is an individual, you know, when that athlete steps into the uh, ring or the octagon, um, it is those by the self. So how much do you manipulate them and how much um, do you actually, you know, speak and how much does the athlete have influence in, in all these things? You know, so this is actually kind of a weird thing because obviously I've been in a couple of different places, but now that we're in this team environment, this, this, you know, Sanford MMA, the majority of our sessions are actually team sessions. So a lot of our strength and conditioning is, has kind of went away from the traditional MMA one-on-one -on -one everything needs to be so individualized for you. You're so different than this fighter to this fighter to this fighter where, you know, a lot of the conditioning, a lot of the timing, a lot of the different, I want to call them just the accessory movements that we're doing with our, with our focus lifts are individualized throughout a session. And everybody sort of has their menu for what they are going to be doing during each one of their individual workouts. Um, but we're running them a lot more now as, as groups. And, and to be honest with you, I like it a lot better. I mean, that, that's just what I'm used to. And I think we're getting more competition out of these guys. Um, you know, I've just kind of come full circle on this. Um, you know, there was a point in time where, where, like you said, you know, this is such an individualized sport. Everything needs to be so meticulous and this and that. I, and I've kind of come full circle on that where it's like, 
it really doesn't necessarily. It's still the same sport. I understand they're coming from different backgrounds. And I understand there are different things. Like a wrestler is going to have different imbalances than a judo player is going to have different than this. But again, if we can create the proper menu, if we can create the, the proper changes in their warm up and their cool down, and everybody has their own thing individualized, really the, the meat and potatoes of the program can stay the same. The modalities can stay the same. This is where rep schemes change. This is where these people change. And, and it's become a little bit more, in my mind, competitive. And the results are, are better. I mean, realistically, we're, we're winning a lot of fights. And again, I'm going to knock on wood. We're, we're winning a lot of fights. And uh, it's just, it's working out well. And again, it's one of those things that if, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and say that it's my program. Like, this is my program. This is, no, it's not that. It's what I've put together and what I've developed is to fit the scheme of all of the disciplines, right? If I'm over at, let's say, you know, American Top Team or American Kickboxing Academy or something like that, I'm sure what I would be doing is totally different, but it's not. It's what fits what we're trying to do. And, uh, you know, right now this team environment and what they're trying to build, that, that's become sort of kind of the staple on, on what we're doing. Probably groups of, you know, not like full team groups, but, you know, right now we kind of have a group that's sort of our younger up and coming fighters. That's probably our largest group of about 15 to 20. Right. And then outside of that with my UFC guys that are in camp, as opposed to, you know, out of camp guys, I'll be running anywhere from about three to six for those smaller groups. Um, you know, somebody like Kamaru, who obviously is the world champion and, and has some very individualized, you know, things, physical characteristics, you know, a lot of the work that he and I do are typically, you know, two to three people will work with him, you know, that kind of thing, maybe a group of two, maybe a group of three, some one-on-one, -on -one, depending on where we're at in the camp. But, you know, for the most part, our guys have, have bought into that. And, and I like it a lot better. It's, it creates a lot better morale, creates a lot better team environment. And it's what I'm used to. It's what I like to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's working well. I mean, that, that's the one thing I could say. The results are working well. If those results start to fall behind obviously modifications and changes will be made i think that's the thing you know if it's not broken don't try don't try and fix it and uh, i think you mentioned it you know earlier on in the in the chat but um there are cultures that you need to uh, when you go into different environments and um you know if you're training with other people i know with the, with the power lifters and with, with, with rugby and you know the the boxes that we've got we've got in the gym um when you're in that environment and it creates that culture, you all push each other along, which I think, yes, you know, we've, we've touched on the uh, sports science side of things, but I think that plays a, a strong part as well, wanting to push people along. Um, and sort of the, the next question I wanted to just um, uh, to, to round up, if you like, is especially with, and you touched on it at the start about um, in this or heading into this new normal, if you like, you know, with potentially not as many crowds or anything like that. Um, what's your take on the on the research that's that's progressing with you know combat athletes and um, making sure that they can perform come uh, competition day and um, develop in that area? Um, what are your thoughts on uh, how things are going to progress and how to um, uh, inject a little bit more sports science into the combat world, if you like? No, I think with this, I mean, I think the gold standard, I mean, has been set. I think with what the UFC Performance Institute has been able to, to provide in the MMA world, um, you know, they, they've really brought it to life where, you know, I think for a little while there, there was just a, a few camps, myself, you know, Drew and American Top Team, Tony Ricci and, uh, you know, Longo Weidman um, that were really kind of using this in this field. Um, and now I think that the UFC Performance Institute has kind of brought it to life and the, you know, the education, the workshops, I think you got, you know, Dr. Duncan French out there who, who's running the ship. And then you have Bo Sanvidal, amazing strength coach, Heather Linden, great physical therapist and Charles Stahl and, and the rest of the team. I don't, I, you know, if I missed anybody, I apologize, but they've, uh, they've really been able to kind of lead the way for, you know, and, and again, myself too, I, you know, there's obviously a lot that I've learned from them as well, but I think they've been able to, to reach and lead the way to some of those other camps and stuff that, you know, obviously I just, you know, we didn't have the resources to do and, and the communication and stuff like that. Um, 
So I think with the work that they're doing, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, you have Landau Performance in Denver, who, who's also doing just a, an amazing job at, at everything that they're doing as well. Um, so it, it's growing. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's going to grow. And I think we're going to need it. I mean, I think, I think being able to utilize sports science, being able to utilize some of these, these team apps and, and things like that are going to be able to assist and be new forms of communication and things like that, especially if we are limited into a position where all four coaches can't be in the same room at the same time with these 10 athletes and stuff like that. At least I'm going to be able to pull an objective or a subjective piece of information from both the coach and the athlete and sort of have a better grasp on, on, on what precisely they were, they were going through. You know, I, I don't think you're ever going to be able to beat observation. You know, I always think, I always say that in, and this is no disrespect to any strength coaches, but I believe being in the room on a daily basis, being able to see the actual practice and be able to see the actual disciplines, it's always going to make you better at your, at your craft, be able to, you know, to better adjust, to be able to better, you know, program that day, make adjustments on the fly and stuff like that. I, I do. Um, but again, for those strength coaches that, that don't have that, you know, that own their own businesses and train multiple athletes from multiple disciplines and things like that, forms of communication and things like that, that they're able to obtain, you know, they can obviously go out there and perform just as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the, the last question, obviously we've covered quite a lot of topics there and touched on some different areas. Um, but for everyone listening, what would be your take home points or words of wisdom? I know you touched on a couple of things there, but this is always the last question that is, uh, yeah, to, to finish off with. All right. So since this is the strength chat, I would assume a lot of the listeners are strength and conditioning professionals. And again, this can be different disciplines, sports science, whatever it is. If you like the idea of working in this field, but you haven't experienced it, take time to experience it first. And what I mean by that is this is a field that you have to absolutely live, breathe, die, love this field. You have to be invested into it because it's not a normal field. You're going to have so many different people out here that you're going to see working there nine to five, Monday through Friday, weekends off, enjoying their evenings where here we are, we're going to be waking up four hours before them. We're going to have to be working in the middle of the day, trying to get caught up for our evening sessions. And then here we're going to be back on the floor at night, all the way up until night, Saturdays, Sundays, traveling. Like this is a field that you have to absolutely love because the time invested is going to be like no other field out there. It's going to be on match. So, you know, make sure this is what you want to do. Experience this before you, before you commit fully. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a good, a good piece of advice. I know from, um, you know, the, the sporting environments that I've done uh, interns in and from uh, other coaches that I know within work, work within that field, it is, um, uh, it is something that you've got to, uh, you've got to want to do and, 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 and enjoy doing it. I mean, I know that, you know, a lot of the things that I'll read and listen to and, and everything like that, um, uh, I enjoy listening to it as well, but, you know, I think sometimes you do have to, well, absolutely you do have to put the, uh, put the work in for it. Um, Thanks a lot, Corey, for taking time to, to chat with me. Um, a lot of things covered there and um, a lot of good uh, good content and information. Um, for everyone listening who might have any questions about things that we've spoken about today or uh, wants to see the, the content and information that you put out there, where can people find you or reach out to you? I think the easiest thing for me is Performance at gmail.com. Also, if you're, you know, for me, I feel like, the most interaction that I have is with potential students, grad students. If, if, it's, if this is something you're interested in and in being able to gain this laboratory experience with, you know, not only the highest level of fighters, but, you know, NHL, NFL, NBA athletes, you know, it's pretty common for our lab. Look up Nova Southeastern University based out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And my email is on there at Dr. C. Peacock. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, yeah. Same thing. Social media. I've actually sort of taking a hiatus off of there. I don't, I don't kind of not sure if I'm really ever going to get back into that, that whole path of things, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. I think sometimes it is, it is good to have a little bit of a break. I know I was on a, a course over the weekend and um, 
where where the course was didn't really have a lot of signal until I went to the went to the hotel and actually it was quite nice uh, having a little bit of a, a little bit of a breather and it's one of those things that myself and a couple of other coaches in the gym um, just you know can sometimes leave our phone at the side and um, get kind of zen just in the in the coaching side of things rather than worrying about oh I need to go, I need to have a look at this I think um, yeah another take on point you know so uh, focusing on the coaching side of things. You don't need to worry about about the other side of it. That's the thing, man. That's one thing that I can honestly say in my my tenure of coaching, I have never once picked up my phone during a strength and conditioning session. Yeah. Never once. Some of the guys will be like, here, can you record this for me? Yeah, sure, I'll do it with your phone. But I've never taken my phone on the floor. Never got just, you know, for me, I took two weeks away completely, haven't touched the social media thing, and I don't think I'm going back. Yeah. It's like one of those things where um, it's like when you go to a gig or a concert and uh, you're looking through the screen and watching, yeah. kind of just drop that down and just just look at it, look at yourself. <laughs> I'm tired of it. It brings the worst out of people, so <laughs> I'm done with it. <laughs> um, thanks again, Corey, for taking the time to chat. We really, really enjoyed um, you know chatting all things sports science with you. Um, I think there's a couple of topics there that, like you mentioned, we could have spoken um, uh, a lot longer uh, on these. Um, but thanks again. Thanks a lot to everyone listening and I will see you all next week. All right. Thanks, buddy.